Let me pray, and then we will get into the message that God put on my heart for today. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for drawing every person that you have drawn to the mission. God, I just pray that you would seal in our hearts the message that you've put in my heart. Give us ears to listen. And God, I pray that you remove all distractions from this room. God, I pray that as we sang, that we would be led in your love to those around us. And God, that we would be attentive to your calling and your word on our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we give this day to you. In your name, amen. All right. So thank you all for braving the gorgeous Michigan weather, the call up north, the barbecues, and everything else to come to church today. It's so awesome to see so many of our friends here at church this morning. And um, with the 4th of July now in our rearview mirrors, I'm starting to see some of those Christmas in July sales now. <laughs> our culture just seems to never want to stop trying to push Christmas back further and further into the year, do they? And on the slide are a couple of examples I clipped when I was on the internet this week with names intentionally hidden to protect the guilty. But they illustrate what I'm talking about. There isn't anything quite like a cartoon Santa swimming with fish or Santa kicking back on the beach that says Merry Christmas, right? The but for me, the idea of Christmas in July takes me back to right around this time six years ago when a gift I gave to a friend ended up impacting me in some pretty profound ways. In fact, the title of today's sermon is called Adding a Butterfly, and it was inspired by the giving of that gift. But to understand that meeting, I'm going to need to tell you a story that I'll get to in a few minutes. But before I do, I wanted to share a few verses from Scripture that frame where we're headed today. They're from James 1 in the Message Translation, where James, who was the brother of Jesus, wrote this. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help, and you won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think that you're going to get anything from the master that way, adrift at sea, keeping all of your options open. We pick up in verse 12. Anyone who meets a testing challenge head-on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons loyally in love with God, their reward is life and more life. And then continuing to verse 16, where James wraps up. So my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light, cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle, he brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all of his creatures. Now, to be perfectly honest, I've had a few struggles with this passage. The whole idea of finding gifts in the midst of tests and challenges, that one kind of hurts. Because what tends to manifest in me during times of testing and challenge, they're things like stress, like worry, like anxiety. Something tells me I'm not alone either. But another reason that I struggle is because if you know me really well, 
You know that I'm a person who loves to surprise people with gifts that they are not expecting, that either celebrate them, to honor them, or appreciate them. But to challenge them? I don't think so. Not my style. Doing so would be kind of like this. A few years ago, I had the box that's on this slide made for my wife, Christina. Uh, and I had it done for Christmas. In the box, there are 25 compartments that, that I stashed little gifts behind. And Christina opens one a day, starting on de December 1st, up through Christmas Day, which is that big door in the middle, which is her favorite one. Now imagine that I had decided to set things up so that each door could only be opened by solving a difficult puzzle or sur surviving a trial of some sort. I don't think that'd be able to, I don't think that'd go over pretty well. I can hear her now saying, that's not a gift, take it back. <laughs> but a few years ago, I feel like I got a glimpse of what James was trying to say when he penned those words almost 2,000 years ago and what they might mean for us today. And what happened was I had a friend who was experiencing a very stormy and dark time in her life. It's the type of situation where you start to question everything. What you're doing with your life, your relationships, who your friends are, what you believe. There's no doubt in my mind that most of us in this room have, experiencing, have experienced times like this. Some of you may be experiencing them right now in your lives. But in times like this, it can be very hard to see God working in your life. It can be hard to feel like he wants to do something about your circumstances. And it can be very hard to have any sense at all that he loves you. He does, by the way. So if you're in a storm like this right now, I really encourage you to seek out a member of our prayer team before you leave. They will pray with you and confidentially. And where two or more are gathered in, in, are gathered in his name, he promises us that he'll be there. So take us up on that opportunity and get prayer over your circumstances for breakthrough, for whatever you need him to do in your life. But regardless... It's not at all uncommon, I think, for people in these situations to look for a clear sign in the sky that he's there. But God will often choose to work in ways that we don't expect instead. Like how it seems like it's actually his desire to partner with us and to use the people around, like you and me, to bring hope to his children, regardless of where they are in their spiritual journey. He can use you. But one thing that you can be absolutely certain of is that God does not desire any of his children to be lost. Not one. A couple of verses of chapter 3 of Second Peter put it this way, again from the message translation. And the context is end times, but it, it, it fits. Don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. God isn't late with his promise as some measure lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anybody lost. He's giving everyone time to change. And I believe that we serve a God who continually uses the people and circumstances around us to let us know that he's near. But we often miss it because we're looking in the wrong places. The book of 1 Kings has a story in it where the prophet Elijah experienced this very phenomenon. He was on the run from his enemies, and he had literally reached the end of himself. He asked to die. But then God showed up, and here's what happened. The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard that whisper, the Bible tells us that he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave he was in. And I think sometimes that we're like Elijah. We're expecting God to show up in power when what's actually needed is for him to show up in that gentle whisper, for him to provide a nudge or impression to a person who can bring his love to another person and draw us all closer together in the process to show us that we're not all as disconnected as it might seem. Back to the story, though. As part of my friend's situation, it turns out she needed to have surgery in her neck area. She had a big, ugly scar right here. Stitches. After the surgery, she spent several lonely, painful days in recovery as a result. I would text her from time to time to see how she was doing, and while many things were said, it was clear that she was going, what she was going through was continuing to take a, whole, a toll on her mentally and physically. Eventually, however, she did come home, and a group of co-workers and me decided to send her some flowers. I'm not ex exactly sure how I ended up being put in charge of this. This is not really what I'm good at. But I soon found myself browsing the website of a local florist, trying to find an arrangement that I thought she would like. I ended up landing on a bright yellow one called Heart of Gold. It, after all, seemed fitting, based on what I knew of my friend's heart and character, when she was a lot healthier, mentally and physically. When I went to go to the checkout, though, here's what happens. I'm sure you've all seen this. A bunch of add-ons show up. It's time to add a teddy bear. Time to add the candy. Time to add the card, right? One of them, though, was an artificial monarch butterfly. And I had this little nudge that I should add it to the arrangement, but I wasn't sure why. It's not usually my style to, pur to purchase those extras, by the way, especially when buying flowers, because holy moly, are they expensive. <laughs> but it wasn't a super expensive add-on, and besides, it made me smile. So I added to the purchase, and then I didn't give it a second thought. When my friend got the flowers, she was pretty thankful that we had remembered her. And I know the picture quality isn't the greatest on the slide, but that is a picture that she texted me of them. This is where things got really interesting. She asked a question that completely shocked me. How did you know? It turns out that my, while my friend was in the hospital, one morning around 4 a.m., she went on Amazon.com and ordered two packets of milkweed seeds that she decided she was going to plant along the river that she lived on. And the reason was to attract monarch butterflies. Now, to those of you who are not butterfly enthusiasts, the connection between milkweed and monarch butterflies might not make a whole lot of sense. But after doing some research, I found out that milkweed plants are actually essential for their survival. Monarch butterflies only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. And their caterpillars only eat milkweed as well. But here's the picture I want to paint for you. Imagine that there is a person who's alone in the dark after surgery. She's been battling depression, anxiety. She's been through all kinds of rough times. She's in a lot of pain. There's worry. Because let's face it, you're not up at 4 a.m. because things are hunky-dory. Maybe there are prayers asking whether or not things are going to be okay. Maybe there are doubts that God exists at all. But in the midst of those struggles and questions, she decides to purchase seeds that will undoubtedly help monarch butterflies just on a whim and because she can't think of anything else to do. And within days of this taking place, there's a group of people who are trying to bless her and cheer her up 
to let her know that there are people around her who care. And the guy who ends up in charge of getting some, getting some flowers sent to her in order to do just that gets the impression that a monarch butterfly should be part of the arrangement that he's about to purchase. There's really no earthly explanation, I think, for doing something like that. But through the magic of the internet, a click is made and it shows up. Now, there's some who we might attribute this to coincidence, but that's hard for me to believe. The number of times I had discussed butterflies with this friend was exactly zero. Exactly zero. I didn't know that she had purchased the milkweed seeds or that monarch butterflies were even on her heart at all. All I had was that impression to go on. This brings us to a key question, though. And it's very simple, but I also think it's very challenging. And as I present it up on the slide, you don't have to answer it right away, but here it is. Do you believe in a God that does these kinds of things? Not can, but does. And what I mean is, is that when I think about my picture of God, I often tend to think of him only being concerned with the big stuff. Big stuff in quotes. What kind of job I have, how I raise my kids, those kinds of things. But a butterfly on a floral arrangement? Doesn't that seem trivial? Silly? Then I go back to that passage of Scripture that I started this message with. Anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. So my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light casking, cascading down from the Father of light. And after seeing what happened to my friend and reading James's words, there's no doubt in my mind, I do believe in a God who does these things. And I hope that after hearing this story, that you're at least open to the possibility that he does as well. Moreover, I'm forced to consider some longer-term implications to this story. For instance, if you found inspiration in hearing it, how much more would you find hope in a story like this if it had actually happened to you? What would it do for your faith? Here are a few things that it did for mine. And as I thought about them, I realized that there really are action steps for today. After the events I just shared with you unfolded, because I'm a thinker, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I believed about the goodness of God. There's just no way that I could keep on believing that God was too busy for my little problems anymore. And I realized that he is just as interested. And the things that seem trivial in our lives is the things that seem huge. And because of this realization, I came to believe that God is better, far better, than I ever could have imagined he was. It's sort of like the story I once heard about a man whose wife planned a surprise fishing trip for him. There are many ways she could have gone about this, such as to simply book the plane tickets or the hotel for him. But she took the planning to a whole nother level. She not only made all the arrangements, but she packed his gear. She called his boss to get him the time off. She called his friend who was going to meet him at the fishing spot. She picked him up at work. She took him to the airport. And she made sure that he wouldn't have to pay for anything. She not only cared for the big things, but the small things as well. And how blessed do you think her husband was to know that his wife had gone to all that trouble for him? And I believe that our God works the same way. Jesus painted a beautiful picture of this truth when he said in Luke 12, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, 
Not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You matter to him, even to the smallest details. And I believe today that he's inviting us to let him into some things that we may have not have thought were important enough. And see what happens when we do that. The second, the second action step I have for you is to look for God in the everyday events of life. In the Elijah story we looked at a few minutes ago, we saw that the Lord was simply not to be found within the large, within the attention-grabbing displays of power that people in the culture at the time would have associated with godlike power. And so God was not in the great and powerful wind. He was not in the earthquake, nor was he in the fire. While God can and has done many powerful things in history, like parting the the Red Sea or appearing in a column of fire or feeding thousands of people at once, the reality is is that that's where we're always looking for God. We're going to have a hard time finding him. Events on that scale tend to be reserved for pretty special seasons in history. They otherwise seem very few and far between. Therefore, we must remember where God was when he told Elijah to look for him. He was in the gentle whisper. The thing that you would have to pay close attention to or you'd miss it. Like taking the time to appreciate someone who was underappreciated. Like granting grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. like paying funeral costs for somebody who can't afford, like buying grocery cards for a family in need, or even, or even, like adding a butterfly to a floral arrangement to let a friend know that you care. For if we begin to look for God in the everyday like that, I believe all of us will start to see him working in ways we never could have imagined. And it'll make us smile and rejoice in him. For as Jesus promises us, promises us in this in Luke 11. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. So let us be seekers of God in the everyday, and we'll find him. The third action step I have for you, it's kind of a clever play on our title, is to add a butterfly. What I mean is to take a risk and do something that you feel that God is calling you to do. This could be to call that person you haven't talked to in a while, or give a gift to someone you know who could use one. It could be to invite a friend out to lunch or dinner. It could literally be any number of things, and they don't have to be big. But I encourage you to pray about this, and to partner with God in doing something that you feel that he wants done. If your heart is in the right place and you get a warm feeling impression about doing something that you wouldn't normally do, even though it might feel a little weird, trust that's from God and then watch what happens as a result. Lastly, and I think this is perhaps our most important action step, is that we need to learn to let go of why questions and our own assumptions sometimes, especially during times of struggle. What we need to realize is that we can sometimes only appreciate the genius of what God is doing with the passage of time. Sometimes we find out quickly what he's up to. I'm really thankful for those moments. Sometimes the answers come slowly. And then sometimes we'll never know the side of heaven until we see 
our friends with us, and we understand the impact of our lives on them. But this is where we need to trust God by faith with anything that we do with him and in partnership with him. For me, I often think about what would have happened in the story that I just told you if I'd done what I'd normally do. I start to question my marching orders, and my stubbornness, and my humanity, and my all-knowingness. I can literally hear the arguments in my head right now. They're there. This is stupid, God. It's a butterfly, really? It's just a piece of plastic, God. I've spent enough on these flowers, God. I paid for extra rush delivery. I don't need to spend another dime on this, God. What's this going to matter? The flowers are going to be dead in a week anyway. Who cares? Men, send the flowers anyway. If I'd let those arguments win, though, through my own human understanding of things, I guarantee you I would have missed out on what God was trying to show me. Guaranteed. I would have ruined the surprise and delight in seeing what God did with my small act of obedience. And I would have missed an opportunity to show my friend that there is a God out there that saw her pain and wanted to draw closer to her. So I can definitely see that this was no accident, that God was there pulling the strings to bring about his purposes, to show a couple of his children how amazing he really is and how he cares for us. Sending flowers to my friend would have been a blessing to her to be sure, but that was not good enough for God. He wanted to take it up a notch. He took what I intended to be a blessing, and in his goodness, he turned it into a miracle that touched both of our lives and drew us closer together as friends. Before I finish up, I wanted to circle back to that difficult passage of Scripture that we started with, where it says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its true colors. So don't try and get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. And I hope that by sharing the story with you, that you can see how a faith-filled life can turn tests and challenges into gifts that build our faith and they shape our character. He doesn't cause those bad things to happen to us, but when they do, God can use them to give him or to give us the best gift of all, himself, his peace. And where we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is close, even when it doesn't feel like it, and that he absolutely cares about every last detail of our lives. Here's a popular short story called Footprints that, I may, that I'm sure many of you have heard that illustrates the truth of what I just shared. It goes like this. One night, a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes from his life. And for each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other belonging to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path, his, uh, the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him, and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, he said, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most that you would leave me. And the Lord replied, My precious, 
precious child. I love you, and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you only saw that one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And I believe with all my heart that this story and the butterfly story that I shared with you reveal the truth of the scripture that's up on this slide. That there is nothing deceitful about God's purposes and that his true desire is to show us off as the crown of all of his creatures. For as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. My friends, may we always know that we are loved that much. That his love being formed in us is truly a gift worth treasuring. And that in our darkest times and most challenging moments, he may be calling someone in your life to add a butterfly. Amen. Guys, thank you for letting me share with you again today. Let me pray and close this out. God, you're good. God, we, may we have the faith to believe what you say over our lives, that we would have the faith to believe you even when it's hard. God, may you come and comfort us in our moments where we're challenged and bring restoration and breakthrough and your love into everything that is going on. God, we know and recognize your sovereignty over all. And we trust and believe through faith that you know what's best for us. And may we come to believe that and know it in deeper ways at all times and in all circumstances. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Amen.